As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest tonight, our activist farmer, Joel Salatin, co-founder of Polyface Farms, is back here with us again on Reluctant Preppers. He's here to talk with us about the topic of can I feed my family and can we feed the world? Joel, thanks for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you, Donna. It's wonderful to be with you, yes. Now, you've got a talk that you give uh, based on uh, work that you've done there at Polyface Farms, which is not only does uh, research and uh, heritage uh, sort of reclaiming uh, some of the lost art of uh, growing food and communing with nature, but you also are a teaching facility. You have a wide range of interns and, and lecture series and books and everything that you do to spread the word and, and educate people. One of your topics is, can we feed the world? And when I was reading about that, it brought me back to a couple of episodes from my life. One was uh, on in our mega grocery store that we used to frequent uh, when we lived in um, in Minnesota. Uh, there, w- I was in the organic section as I always started out uh, picking out organic vegetables, and the produce manager was there uh, putting things in that section. And on his way back to the what they call the conventional, which I really think they should label the experimental section, and uh, he said. He was. He said, "You know, I, I was complaining about. You know, you just do. You, you have this uh, particular whatever it was. Uh, not in. Not in this week." He says, "No, no. It's hard to keep that stuff in. It goes bad too quickly. Nobody buys it." He says, "You know." He says, "Between you and me, if it was all organic farming, the world would starve. We would all starve." He said, "They can't produce. Look at these." He showed me some smaller uh, produce or whatever. He says, "You know, compared to what we got over there, we can get it for less money, and they can put more, and they can get more uh, to feed to feed the world." That was one uh, anecdote that I've lived through. Another one was on a uh, local um, radio station recently. They were talking with people about uh, water pollution and whether water is drinkable and from the municipal water supply, that sort of thing, and, and uh, people blaming agricultural runoff as being a major contributor uh, to, in our area to water pollution. And someone was on there saying, you know, you've got to realize that it's necessary to use all these chemicals because um, there's that's just the only way that we're going to get the, the productivity out of the land. And it just brought me back. I thought, okay, we've got to talk about this because that's not what I believe is, is the end of the story. It may be uh, what's now called conventional wisdom, but it's certainly not uh, heritage wisdom. So if you could enlighten us on the topic of can we feed the world, and then in the spirit of reluctant preppers down to the scale of the individual household, the individual family is, can I feed my family to really walk us through? Um, I know it's not a simple question to answer because there's so many dimensions to it, but realistically, how much land would a person need to be able to feed their family depending on the methods and the practices that they use? And what would those be that they could do to get the most out of the least space? So, uh, if you could just start us out at the macro level of can we feed the world, what's up with this idea that, that's become almost accepted at face value in our culture that uh, were it not for chemical uh, monoculture and huge scale chemical agriculture that we would be all be starving? Sure. Okay. Well, uh, uh, you have to understand, I mean, first of all, that, uh, that the problem of soil fertility has not come about just since chemical fertilization. Uh, Soil fertility has been a problem in virtually every civilization since the beginning of time. And um, so the the soil fertility issue, of course, was coming to a head back at the turn, about 1900. Um, You know, uh, goodness, in the early 1800s, um, you know, Thomas Jefferson was talking about how fast, you know, fertility was depleted and and after he died in, in the early 1800s, then in the next 20 years, they discovered this, um, you know, this, uh, uh, pelic- this pelican booby bird manure out off of uh, Peru. And within like 20 or 30 years, um, using, you know, Chinese labor, excavated it and, and sent it all to the U.S. and to Great Britain. Um, what I'm getting at is 
that the fertility problem was 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 really climaxing as the as the population began to uh, increase, industrialization began to increase, cities became much much bigger, and so there was this this huge you know, worldwide seeking about how are we going to feed ourselves. This question is not new, and so there were two threads. One thread was that life is fundamentally mechanical. And of course, that was developed by an Austrian uh, chemist named Justus von Liebig, who in 1837 um, wowed the world with the notion that all life is just a rearrangement of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And he's basically attributed as the, the father of chemical fertilization. Um, and, and of course, that that went on then to the Faber-Bosch process and the, the Green Revolution and the um, uh, you know Norman Borlaug and, and and all the folks that uh, that that moved the chemicals forward, uh, including the fact that, that that after World War II we had these huge stockpiles of um, of of, chem, of N, P, and K, nitrogen, nitrogen, potassium, and um, phosphorus, which of course are the basis of ammunition. So once the World War II was over, we had these mass stockpiles of explosives, of, of, of raw materials for explosives, and didn't need it. And uh, that, of course, was primarily in P and K. And so that, of course, went on. That was very cheap, uh, very simple to apply, and went on America's uh, uh, farmland. There was another thread, though, occur occurring at the same time. And um, for lack of a, a better guru for it, probably the leader was a guy named Sir Albert Howard who was experimenting in India during the 1920s to 1940s, and he essentially uh, developed the modern scientific um, uh, formula for aerobic composting, and in 1943 presented his stuff to the, to the world uh, in a blockbuster called An Agricultural Testament, which took a fundamentally biological pro approach to life as opposed to fundamentally mechanical approach to life. Now the problem was that Howard's approach of biology, composting, um, uh, did not sit well with farmers because it required a lot of chipping and hauling and, and moving around material and farmers frankly were tired of shoveling poop and if they could get stuff in a bag and spread it on a, in a little hopper uh, they were a lot happier than having to shovel and shovel and shovel and, and have poop everywhere. And so, um, and so you know, the, the, the infrastructure necessary to capitalize on Howard's biological approach to life did not really exist until the mid-50s and late-50s when we started getting uh, dependable tractors with front-end loaders, uh, black plastic pipe to be able to haul water uphill and, 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 and to water things, um, you know, chippers and shredders and, and, and rural electrification, uh, all of these things, uh, you know, cheap concrete to make, make pads to, to um, you know, do, do static piles on. Uh, you know, these were all things that developed, but mainly it was the chippers, the shredders, and, and, and uh, cheap, cheap front end loaders. Uh, that took the you know the labor the the uh, the human labor out of the out of the equation, um, and so so what happened was with the influx of cheap N P and K from chemicals uh, from the from the war effort, uh, the development of those the the bagging of those the distribution of those the marketing of those, the laboratory the mining of those okay uh, that all essentially got paid for in the war effort. And so you had basically a salvage operation here with the early chemical fertilizer industry as it exploded post-World War II. The other side, of course, um, lagged behind because we didn't have the infrastructure to develop it. Now, what's interesting is that today, today the biological approach from the, from the human you know, microbiome project to the most sophisticated um, um, soil analysis from a biological standpoint, uh, whether it's it's mineral, uh, um, uh, you know, living materials, you know, foliar foliar nutrients sprayed on with calypso music and, and, and magnetized for the stomata to open their mouths wire on the leaves and and suck it up better. Um, 
all those things have developed now to where I'll say our side is running circles, literally running circles around the chemical approach. But during that lag period, the chemical approach, it, it populated our colleges, it populated, it, was, it created a, a, a very large business um, and dominated Wall Street, dominated media, dominated advertising. It became the de facto orthodoxy of the culture. And so what happens is that when innovation finally overtakes the dominant orthodoxy in a culture, that dominant orthodoxy doesn't go away softly into the night. And, and in fact, many people truly do believe uh, that, that that orthodoxy is still, you know, is still the right approach. Here's the truth. The truth is that if we had had a Manhattan project for compost, not only would we have fed the world, we would have done so without three-legged salamanders, infertile frogs, and a dead zone the size of New Jersey in the Gulf of Mexico. That, that's the truth. That's the thing that you have to remember. Number two, the, the global, um, you know, globally, we have never in the history of humankind thrown away half of all human edible food. That's what's happening now with our long distance transportation. Look at the dumpster behind the supermarket. Look at the stuff that gets thrown away, the food that gets thrown away. Uh, the, the, the baguettes, the, the breads, the, I mean, uh, whey, spoiled milk, uh, produce that's not the right size or shape or has a blemish, blemished apples. I mean, name it. There are the stuff, stuff that, that used to feed people is now literally thrown away. And so the fact is we are now producing enough food to feed almost double the world's population right now uh, there is no, you know, no food shortage. In fact, you know, we would do well to produce much better food, uh, um, you know, on, in smaller, smaller quantities. And the final thing I'll just say is that there is a tremendous amount of unutilized land. Uh, the U.S. has 36 million acres of lawn, <laughs> 36 million acres of lawn, and we haven't even gotten to the golf courses yet. Uh, it has 36 million acres housing and feeding recreational horses. That's 72 million acres. That's enough to feed the entire country without a single farm or ranch. The, the, the point is that integrated, integrated food systems are far uh, product, more productive and they have less spoilage due to a shorter chain of custody from plant or from, from field to plate. And when you start integrating these systems, um, you see way more production and, you know, you see way less uh, spoilage. So if we, if we actually um, uh, looked, at the, looked at the production capabilities, even a novice gardener with a diversified, you know, backyard garden is far more productive per square yard than the most sophisticated um, uh, you know, a monospeciated industrial uh, farm. That that's the truth, and um, and and uh, you know the, all the other all the other uh, insinuations, innuendos, and whatever um, are simply false. Uh, you know, when you when you look at the way the research is done, research is done very uh, linearly in a reductionist in a Western reductionist compartmentalized way and so this is here's typical research you know uh, a, a, a PhD sends a couple of aspiring you know masters to, to um, Thailand to study you know uh, 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 hybrid rice compared to indigenous production and so they put the fertilizers on they measure the rice you know and, and, and the rice was uh, X number of bushels per acre over here they do the indigenous, where they plant the rice, and they have they put ducks in uh, to do weed control. They put tilapia in to do snail control. They plant the banks in bok choy and Chinese cabbage, and they measure the rice there, the rice there, and it of course is not as productive as the rice over in the chemical paddock. And so then they print their re report and say. 
um, see, you know, half the world would starve if we did it, you know, without the chemical fertilizers. The problem is they're not measuring the Chinese cabbage, bok choy, tilapia, or ducks because they're there to measure rice. This kind of thing happens all the time. Right here in Virginia, 30 years ago, when I was very, very young, Virginia Tech and, and organics was just coming on. Virginia Tech decided to do a, a study. So they took these, these uh, corn plots that they'd been throwing on chemicals for, you know, to for 40 years, uh, herbicides, pesticides, chemical fertilizers, all that stuff. And uh, they said, here, we're going to take these three. These will be our organic ones. Over here, these three will be our, you know, our, our chemical ones. So they put a hybrid, hybrid seed corn in there. The one, they put in all the chemical fertilizers and all the treatments. And the other one, they did nothing. Nothing. You know, no compost, no, no nothing, just, just planted a corn in the, in the dead soil. And, of course, at the end of the year, you know, they got, they got all this growth out of the, out of the uh, chemical fertilized and nothing, very little, out of the other one. And so, you know, our Commission of Agriculture, in his annual report, you know, said basically, um, you know, organic farming would just, is, is like, um, is like this, you know, the, the big question is deciding which half of the world to starve to death with organic farming. Now, you and I, you and I know, if, if you know anything about soil, you know that you can't dump a bunch of, of, of toxic chemicals on soil year after year after year after year and have it function like a truly, you know, living, high compost, organic matter, humus, uh, total food web with the gibberellins, the mycorrhizae, the, and, and, and forming the, the, you know, the globulins and, and all the stuff that it's supposed to do. It, you know, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't function. It takes, that, that's why in organic certification, it takes three years in transition to get certified because it takes three years even with excellent management to get the soil anywhere close to a living medium and so so the that virginia tech analysis and of course that was done in all the land grant colleges because they all copy each other they all you know drink the same kool-aid from the same jar and so the result is that that the press releases and the new york times and and the media gets flooded with this with this notion and of course the research is so prejudicial it, it wouldn't hold up in any uh, you know any true you know scientific um, uh, inquiry but this is you know this is the science out of the land-grant university and that's why you know I make everybody mad when I say science is not subjective uh, I, mean, I mean it's not objective I mean this is the science coming out of our, our, our laboratories and it and it's an incredibly subjective prejudicial, agenda-driven science that our tax money is paying for. So this continues to jaundice and feed the, you know, feed the storyline that, you know, uh, that, that, that chemicals are, are necessary. Uh, the truth is that when you, when you measure the production today with good state-of-the-art, uh, you know, biologically driven production models, we run circles around the chemicals. That that is absolutely the truth, and um, and the the, da the data is coming more you know every single day. So that's at the uh, macro scale, and it's a message of hope, really, because if you the number of people, it's it's it's. I just sort of sit back and watch as a casual observer. Uh, you know, I've trained as an engineer and as a scientist and to to see over the decades of my life a apparently never-ending increase in the incidence of asthma allergies mm -hmm. uh food intolerances um yeah, food allergies. Uh, in, in, in inflammatory bowel disease mm -hmm. uh, uh on and on uh, all the way to you know uh, breast cancer childhood yes. diseases different things that and and nobody's stopping and just saying Wait a minute. I mean, people are racing for, around for the cure with pink ribbons tied to everything in sight, and nobody's stopping and saying, "Wait a minute. These are not like infectious diseases. What, what what's going on here? Something changed." I mean, as a scientist, the first thing, if you get a different result, you look back at the inputs and say, "What changed? Either either the raw exactly. materials changed or the process changed. Something changed." Yeah. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, I mean, when I, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I mean, you never heard the phrase food allergy. When, when you when you had a, a potluck at church, nobody asked about you know uh, gluten free or 
uh, you know, or, or food allergies or intolerance or anything like that. Nobody labeled anything. Uh, it, it didn't even exist. So, so what's happened is, as we have assaulted, as we have assaulted the earth with these chemicals, what happens is, nature, <laughs> nature bats last. Nature fights back. You punch me in the nose, I'll punch you in the nose. That's that's the, you know, you reap what you sow. That's the that's the whole principle of reaping and sowing. And so when we reap violence against the ecology, the ecology is going to give us back violence against ourselves, and that's exactly what's happening. Back to a practical level, if we could turn our attention now for the rest of the sure. interview about um, the individual who wants to prepare and provide for his family's well-being of primary concern, and we've interviewed just dozens and dozens of experts on here. Interestingly enough, some of them are, are world-recognized gurus and, for example, the precious metals markets, gold and silver. And when we ask even them, what's the number one uh, priority list that you would make if you wanted to store up uh, something for uh, unforeseen hard times. They do not start with precious metals at the top of the list. Even the people who are the, the precious metals bugs, they say, you've got to eat, you've got to drink, you've got to breathe. So they, they talk about food as a number one consideration and water. Right. And uh, so if we could turn it back to the individual homeowner, and and uh, that's another question that is on people's minds sure. Is, is, sure, if I had maybe whatever, 80 acres or 600 acres or something out in the woods. I could have all kinds of animals. I could have all kinds of big gardens. Because people drive, you drive through the countryside, you see these farms that just go on and on, mile after mile. I think, how much does it actually take to feed a family? So if we could right. start with that, is how much land is actually necessary? And I'm sure it varies depending on what, what you're really asking. But just in a ballpark range of figures, how much land is necessary to feed one family? Well, so amazingly small and and there's there are techniques uh i mean you know depending on you, who you talk to it can be anywhere from uh you know from from uh 100 square feet to you know 10 square feet to 200 square feet but it's it's incredibly small if if you look at a whole a whole approach and um uh, for example for example one of the most, uh, probably the most, the single most uh, nutritious thing you can do on the least amount of land is sprouts. You know, like mung bean sprouts, um, sunflower sprouts. I mean, there, there's, I mean, seeds sprout. I mean, and this can be done. There, there are all sorts of little kits out there, and I've listened to countless presentations on this. They're just, they're just fantastic. They're just amazing what you can do in 48 hours with sprout, sprouts in a, in a little uh, uh, kit, whatever, you know, um, 18 inches by 12 inches yeah. Based, yeah. You know, on your windowsill or, or yep. sitting on top of the refrigerator. Yeah, when I was, um, when I was uh, in, in junior high, uh, upper grade school in junior high, my sister really got into this, and she got a sprouting kit, and it was an, a stackable set of yeah. clear uh-huh. uh polycarbonate uh-huh. trays with slots in them and ring in yes. it was about the size of an lp record and then up and up and up you went an inch at a time and oh. you could put in alfalfa or mung beans or any other thing and it sprouted very quickly with trickle down water water methods yep. yeah and and so so th- there is something that can literally feed um you know 30 to 40 percent of your nutritional needs in in living food this is not you know, uh, microwaved, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the germ taken out of it and, and, and all that and, and enriched with, you know, um, synthetic vitamin A or D. Uh, this is the real deal. And, um, and, and it's, it, it can be done in an extremely, extremely small space. All right. So, so there, there is a place to start. Um, secondly, there are all sorts of really high-tech stackable systems. Like right now outside of our sales building, we have a 55-gallon plastic drum that a guy in North Carolina makes. He sells these um, that have uh, 50, probably 50 um, holes uh, around pockets. They're, they're, they, he melts the plastic and, and pooches it out and makes these little pockets. You fill the thing with dirt and co- you layer dirt and compost in there. And it has a central tube. You pack compost in that, 
and it has a drain hole in the bottom. You pour water in the compost, it wicks out into the edges, grows the plants in all these pockets. So you can, we have it full of uh, herbs and, and tomatoes. So you can have, you can have, you know, your all the herbs that you could ever want, um, and 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 tomatoes out the top. What I mean, it, it's just prolific. You can grow cabbages, you can grow all this stuff uh, in this. It, it's a 55 gallon drum, and you can put it on your porch. It's it, it's it's no more footprint than a chair, okay? And and um, and you put your you put your bucket in the bottom where it drains, and when the bucket fills up with water drainage, you just put it back in the compost at the top, and you know every every day or two you just you know empty the bucket back in the top, set it down to the bottom, and over 24 hours the water you know drip, drip, drips into that, and uh, and the stuff is growing gorgeously, uh, the plants grow up, you know it's just it's it's amazing, so um, you know a typical thing that people grow in these things of course is strawberries. And I mean, one barrel like this, I mean, you could grow gallons and gallons of strawberries. So, um, so you know, there, there are a lot of these stackable uh, PVC pocketed uh, columnar, you know, columnar systems now. Now, um, I am not a big fan of, uh, of soilless systems, aeroponics, hydroponics. I know right now those are the darlings of, of again, you know, of the industry, but I will tell you that the tests on the nutritional quality uh, are very disappointing in the nutritional quality. The fact is that these terrestrial plants, uh, when you don't have that full soil soil life web, uh, the plants suffer for it. Now, they're beautiful. Uh, I, I grant you that they're beautiful, but, uh, but they're, they're, um, they're very, very lacking in nutritive capacity as a, as a general rule. I'm not ready to throw out aquaponics in a medium where you use fish, so you're using fish manure into a pebble, uh, into some sort of a pebble type medium because then it, it can colonize with fungal and microbial uh, uh, bacteria to more simulate soil. So I'm not, I'm not throwing out everything, but I, I am suggesting that there, uh, my, my druthers is toward a some, some sort of a you know, a, a soil-based system. So we have these, these stackable things. I mean, there's a, I read a report about a guy, and I think it was Kenya, uh, who, who went down and found a bunch of used 24-inch um, uh, culverts, and he whacked them in 12-foot pieces, sat them on end, packed them full of compost, took a torch, well, before he put a compost, he took a torch and, and pocked a bunch of holes, of uh, pockets in them, and he was he was growing. He had uh, an acre of these. He was growing the equivalent of like 12 acres of uh, broccoli on one acre uh, in these in these vertical tubes, uh, these these old culverts. So so the vertical the idea of vertical production here with with some sort of medium holding plastic PVC, uh, you know, metal mylar uh, something. Uh, is is quite is quite powerful, very very um, um, productive, because you're because you're stacking things. Now, um, most of us have a southern exposure on our house, you know, a, a wall that faces south. Now, um, you know, we we have an old uh, 17, 1790 built house. This is a an old American chestnut log cabin. Uh, that we live in, and we have a state-of-the-art, um, you know, solarium, uh, cedar-built solarium on the south side, and we've grown, um, you know, cold-hardy stuff, lettuces, mescaline mix, salad greens, things like that, all the way through the winter, no additional heat. These things are made really nice now, a lot of heat. We have stones down there for thermal mass uh, recharge. And the, the, the plastic is a real insulative, uh, you know, a tubular type uh, material, and uh, it's really, really slick. Um, and so every single house can have one of these solariums on it. You open the windows, the passive uh, solar heat comes in the house, helps heat your house, and you're growing plants out here in the solarium. And, uh, and, and most people could bear a, you know, a six foot, um, who have a house, uh, unless you're in a condominium or, you know, townhome, uh, you could bear a six foot 
you know, uh, solarium on the, on the south side of your house, covering up that, that south wall. Um, in the summer, there are things that you can do, like in, in Havana, Cuba, when Russia pulled out, of course, they were about to starve to death. And so people there actually developed, uh, and I have not, I have seen pictures, but I have not seen this in person, where they actually made like Venetian blinds uh, that, that, that ima imagined uh, uh, a, glo a great oversized Venetian blind that hung from second story windows down the south side of your house uh, like, like, um, like, like flower, you know, flower trays, okay? Uh, that, that you could just hang down so the side of your house is now uh, has these troughs. Uh, you can make them out of uh, uh, PVC, you know, cut the top, cut a third of it out, fill it with uh, compost and soil. Uh, you can make it out of aluminum guttering. You can make it out of uh, a discarded pipe, um, you know, any number of things. Make it out of wood if you have extra wood lying around. The point is you can make these... Um, uh, you know, flower these uh, troughs, and uh, hang them down the side of your house. Guess what happens? All those plants on the side of your house, they're transpiring, evaporating. You know, uh, uh, moisture, and that cools your house down. Now you don't have to run your air conditioner anymore because because the hot side of your house is all cooled with this vegetation. It's like being in a under a shade tree all day. Um, so you know, th these these are all really um, uh, low-tech, uh, do-it-yourself techniques that can be done. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be a weird neighbor. Everybody will look at you. But, you know, you'll laugh all the way to the kitchen because you'll be reaching out there pulling up carrots and uh, cabbage. And, um, and, and you'll have all this wonderful food hanging all over your house. Don't forget the roof if you have a flat roof. Uh, or if you don't have a real inclined roof, you know, you can grow stuff on the roof. A beehive, you know, a favorite place for beehives is up on the roof. You know, they're high, they're out away from where kids are going to, you know, uh, uh, get into them and, and that sort of thing. And then, and then um, I wouldn't be fair to the whole uh, deal if I didn't point out um, the, what I call the kitchen chickens. Um, you know, there, there are few animals that are more, uh, whatever, e easy and productive than a chicken. And, uh, I mean, the average American family, um, you know, spends a couple $3,000 a year in litter and food for a pet dog or a pet cat or two or three of them or a parakeet or a gerbil or a snake or name your, you know, name your pets. And, um, and, and, and they don't do anything. I mean, they, I mean, except look at you, you know. Uh, you know, come up to you to rub their ears. But a chicken, a chicken in the same footprint can, you know, uh, 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 in the same footprint of a, of a, of a good-sized terrarium or aquarium, okay, can, uh, can eat, all, eat all your kitchen scraps. Now you don't have to put those down the garbage disposal or, or, or put them out on the curb for the garbage trucks and stink up the neighborhood. You feed those to the chickens. The chickens eat that and lay you a couple of eggs a day. Now you have your own eggs, and you have your, your kitchen recycled, and, and their manure, chicken manure, is so um, fertile and, and, and nutritious that you can side dress your plants with it. You can, now, now you're, you know, you're hanging Venetian blind gardens. Uh, you can side dress with your chick, kitchen scraps, and uh, I mean chicken uh, um, uh, litter, and um, and, and, and if I was going to do that, I would have deep litter in the chicken, so they would actually be building compost. Yeah, can again, you explain? We, let's take a moment there, because we have a, a good friend. He's, he's been on this show uh, several times. We call him the guy next door. And uh, he was uh, describing his odorless chicken coop where he would uh, make layers of either diatomaceous earth and uh, right. other materials, absorbent materials in between the layers of, uh, of the chicken litter. But if you could describe, you just talked about deep, uh, if you could no. If you don't, if you don't have a, if you don't have a very expansive yard, I mean, if, if you're in suburbia and you've got a four-acre yard, sure, you know, have a portable chicken shelter, run the chickens out through the yard, you know, and and be fine. But if you have a postage stamp yard, it becomes problematic to run chickens to it because you know the kids are going to bring in poop on their shoes all the time. 
neighbors aren't going to want you're not going to have want a barbecue out there because it's going to be in your sandals and between your toes and all that so then what you want is you want a stationary coop but but what has to move in it is the bedding is is the the, the deep bedding what you want is a essentially a compost pile under the chickens so you have to design it so that you can have 12 to 16 inches of of material under those chickens now that material needs to be carbonaceous so it can be leaves wood chips sawdust peat moss um, um, pine bark uh, you know just anything that's brown anything that's brown um, carbonaceous material put it in there a little bit at a time not a lot a little bit at a time and let it build 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 the deeper it is the better if you can have 24 inches that's even better and you might have to moisten it a little bit once in a while but the, but what happens is it becomes a living medium and actually grows bugs and worms and things which entices the chickens to scratch in it and as the chicken scratch in it they aerate it the aeration stimulates the decomposition the decomposition stimulates the bugs and it, it, it's a wonderful uh, um, regenerating fertility creating medium and it doesn't smell a lick if it if it smells um, then you either don't have enough carbon or the material is capping on top maybe you're using straw or hay which the chickens can't move around and it's getting you know slick you know uh, poopy on top all right that's not what you want what you want is a friable material uh, that's loose enough that the chickens can stir it get down and dust bathe in it uh, flop it all over their feathers you know I mean they can almost when you look at it they're almost swimming in it that's what you're looking for because if, if they're swimming in that medium that means it's highly oxygenated and it's and, and it's doing what it's uh, what it's supposed to do and uh, that's the way I would keep chickens if I was in a condominium or you know it didn't have any outdoor area or or had very limited limited outdoor area and I'm putting them under a you know an outdoor stairwell or something like that and trying to you know double up my my uh, my footprint, my, my housing footprint. Other ideas for uh, maximizing the use of small space uh, in a uh, suburban or urban environment. I know you've weighed in here before with us on how to how to skirt your way gently around uh, restrictive uh, homeowners association guidelines that outlaw outright gardens, but you can you can get by with a lot of uh, potted plants on the deck. And uh, you just mentioned uh, tucking a little coop underneath the stair uh, deck stairs or something like that sure sure well yeah i mean uh i mean uh potted plants uh, yeah i mean i i mentioned stackable uh that takes pots you know one step further but certainly there are lots of uh of of potted things i was just at a, a mother earth news fair in uh, wisconsin and saw a guy where you can order you can order a uh, a fabric um, it's pretty amazing. It's like soft-sided luggage, and and you can make um, garden uh, beds that you fill up. Uh, and what he does, if you're familiar with Hugel culture, uh, what uh, Hugel culture is an Austrian, a German kind of uh, thing where you you put in a bunch of uh, uh, woody material in the bottom, and then just a very small covering of dirt and compost on top. And the plant roots go down in this rotting, highly fungal, uh, uh, wet, spongy, woody medium in the bottom, and just grow, you know, twice as fast as any place else. And 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 it's it's sub irrigated, so the roots never get damp because the the woody material sponges up so much water. And uh, this guy actually um, throws a bunch of woody stuff, you know, basically like like pieces of firewood. Okay. Uh, up two thirds of this, the, these, um, this fabric is oh maybe 30 inches high, and he fills up two thirds of it with wood, and then he just puts this skimpy little layer of, of, of soil uh, and, and compost on top, plants into it, and uh, it's extremely productive. And you don't even have to, you don't even have to bend over, and you can move it around. You can have it in one spot one year, and move it to another spot another year. Um, and and it's you know it, it it gives you a portable. There's a guy, uh, Michael Abelman, uh, probably doing as much urban 
farming as anybody in the world in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. And um, he's actually using uh, plastic, uh, uh, plastic tubs, uh, like, like, like cattle watering troughs. And, uh, and they're all, you, know, you can pick them, all, pick them up with, a, with a forks on a front end loader real easy. Now, not that as an urbanite you're not going to have a front end loader available. But what I'm getting at is that, that these things absolutely could be, you know, put on a, on a, on a caster roller or something to, to roll them around. And, uh, and he, he essentially, he, he's, he's farming uh, asphalt driveways and alleyways and old vacant lots. And if the property gets sold or a developer comes in, he just throws his farm on a flatbed trailer and moves it over to another lot, you know. The, the, whole, the whole farm is, is mobile. And uh, it's mobile, it's modular, and, um, and he's just growing. I mean, he's supplying uh, uh, acres of stuff, uh, supplying restaurants and, and, and creating all these jobs in these, in these poor, um, you know, uh, drug-infested um, uh, parts of town, which typically have, you know, vacant lots and a lot of uh, uh, kind of, you know, crumpled down infrastructure. I mean, this is exactly where he's going. And all these, you know, these drug addicts are, are getting off of drugs because they're coming, they're getting good food, they're working, they've got something meaningful to do, get a good paying job. And uh, it's just, it, 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 it's, it's incredibly um, healing on so many levels to these communities. So, you know, um, you know what can be done in an urban sector is quite amazing. Now, yeah, I wouldn't be fair to the topic if I didn't make a point for one thing. And I haven't, of course, talked about you know, uh, beef and pork and, and, and dairy and things like that. That gets a little bit problematic in the, in, in the city. Um, and so I have to make a, a play here for, along with all of your, what you're doing in your own house, one of the other things, best things that you can do is to go create relationships with farmers who aren't dependent on all the chemicals and who are indeed building uh, 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 um, building soil and nutritious production that will survive even if Wall Street collapses or you know wh whatever. Uh, the, look, the the farm that's selling locally, that's using on-site carbon for fertility, not chemical fertilizer imported from, you know, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, that, that has a local, a local centric, uh, theme to its operation and building soil and multi-speciating that farm is running more on real time solar energy and real time innovation than the neighbor that's selling to, you know, uh, uh, Cargill or Tyson or, or um, you know, Archer Daniels Midland and, and, and exporting stuff, you know, across the globe. Um, and so one of the best things that you can do is build an alliance and a, a relationship. Um, you know, we, we, we hear know your farmer, know your food. We've said it so much it's, it, it, it's, it has become trite. But you know, maybe the thing to do to change it would be know your farmer, know your future. Because, That's a good one, yeah. Um, you know, I just came up with that. I hadn't even thought of that till just now. Um, but, but know your farmer, know your future. If you know your farmer and you have a relationship, I mean, I can tell you that the, the 6,000 families that depend on us for their food, if things went south, they're going to be the ones that eat. Because the supermarket shelves are going to be cleaned out in three days, you know that, and all it takes is a glitch in the, you know, in in the, the uh, distribution system, uh, to 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 stop the ships and stop the transportation, and so the more resiliency, the more resiliency a farm builds into its models, the more resilient it'll be able to withstand shocks and 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 aberrations in the system and if you know two three four five of these farmers you are going to be much better situated to beg 
borrow credit, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 barter uh, um, food in, in the future than somebody who has not done any preparation at laying a foundation of, of, uh, of relationships. And so, um, so, so preparing, um, I guess on this program we could say prepping, um, prepping those relationships is, is one of the best things that you can do. So you actually build a tribe, a local tribe, a local community, a fraternity, if you will, that, that, um, that has a lot of resilience to it. Well, that's good food for thought. Joel, you've really uh, uh, covered the, the gamut of, of a lot of options, and you've probably uh, whetted the appetite for a lot of people who want to find out more in those areas. You've scratched the surface. You've tilled the, tilled the soil of, of uh, interest there, so that people will probably want to dive in and, uh, and uh, you know, see if some of those seeds that you've planted are going to bear fruit in their lives. So. Sure. Uh, that's a really uh, wide range of things that we absolutely were not taught. <laughs> I'm just thinking about home economics class at junior high. You know, yeah. it's like, oh, my gosh. It's okay. like with just a little turn of uh, orientation, yeah. this could be so much uh, more of this wisdom could be shared. And you're here doing it with us on Reluctant Preppers. We're eternally grateful that you always come back and uh, with the... Uh, your wit and wisdom uh, just open our eyes to things that people are are uh, need to be aware of and it doesn't have to take it doesn't have to break the bank it can be done on a low yeah. budget it doesn't have to take huge tracts of land it can be done in a small space it just takes a little bit of open mindedness and and uh, willingness to learn and network and and learn from some people who can tell you uh, there was a uh, inspirational speaker who uh, a, a large corporation that I used to work for uh, sent us to these training classes to talk about um, innovation and how to learn to be um, able to achieve five ten a hundred times more than you normally could by getting past your blind spots and oh. he said he says uh, when he wants to start something big he surrounds himself with people who believe things can happen he says why would I want to have a bunch of consultants come in who can tell me why can't what things can't be done? I can think of those answers myself. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. that's exactly right. So you're you're here uh, time and again telling us what can be done and what is possible. We're delighted for that. If people want to really uh, dig in more and find out more of the the education and resources that you provide, and there are many of them, uh, where can they find you, Joel? Well, the easiest way is our website, Polyface Farms. That's P-O-L-Y-F-A-C-E, polyfacefarms.com. And uh, we have all sorts of things on there, including my speaking schedule. If you want to catch me somewhere where I'm speaking, that's, that's on there as well. And um, love to meet um, any reluctant preppers, um, always my kind of people. And now you you got some specific events. Um, once a month or something, you've got some kind of like a something something Saturday. I can't remember what it was yeah, called. Yeah, it's, it's called called Free Range Saturday. Yeah. And and what we're trying to do there is kind of recreate the um, the, the medieval the medieval uh, craft uh, you know mm -hmm. town town craft block exchange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we've had I don't know twenty some. Um, local artisans that do everything from fiber craft to, to uh, you know, to art, to food, to cheese, to, uh, you know, fermentation, preservation, woodworking. I mean, you know, a guy, guy makes, uh, makes uh, uh, wooden coffins uh, so you can buy your coffin, you know, and have it stored in your house. Talk about, talk about the ultimate prepper, you know, there's the ultimate prepper. Um, and and, and they, they bring a coffin you know, that he made for his, for his wife and she you know, she stands in it, so you know, keep make sure it fits. And <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a great gimmick, but but uh, anyway, um, it's it's been uh, it's been very interesting to see the the breadth, the actual you know breadth and and, and scope of um, there's a lot of there's a lot of things, and it's really been great for us to develop again alliances and relationships with all these people that can make stuff, fix stuff, build stuff. Those are, you know, those are, if you can make something, grow something, or fix something, those are the three key elements for resiliency, in my opinion. 
grow it, fix it, or make it. That's pretty cool. I know we grew up uh, doing all three of those. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, people used to do that because they couldn't afford anything else, so they had to. <laughs> it was out of necessity. <laughs> and now, now we've we've uh, you know segregated and bifurcated our lives so much that we we know more and more about less and less. You know, well, it's a, it's a it's a uh, multi pronged battle that we're being that we're losing because at the same time that the skills are being lost through lack of uh, being handed down on, and, and, you know, uh, learning at the, at the shoulder of a father or a mother, you also have uh, products and methods that are being, where you're being designed right out of it. Uh, people you will okay. just open the hood of a car and look in there and shake their heads and go, hey, yeah. I don't know yeah, how yeah. to do it anymore. And then the same thing goes with yeah. just about anything. So it's, it's yeah. no user serviceable parts in, uh, inside is a sticker on most of the things you buy. So, yeah, um, yeah. So, but, so, so what, what at the end of the day, uh, when thing, you know, if, if and when things um, get dicey, what you want are systems that, that uh, depend on and actually value people as opposed to just machinery. Now, what's interesting is that our entire tax system in the country favors machinery over people. Because you can expense machinery, you can depreciate machinery, you can, you know, it, it actually rewards you for mistreating machinery, um, to you know, for replacement. Um, but if you hire a person instead of a machine, suddenly you have OSHA, you've got FICA, you've got withholding uh, minimum wage, you've got all of these 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 mounds of, of paperwork and 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 things. Um, and you certainly don't get to depreciate a person or, you know, do anything. Uh, and so, so our entire tax structure is prejudiced against people and toward machines, and that's the most vulnerable kind of economy you can create is one where you throw the people away and depend on machinery. That's a very wise observation. Thanks, Joel, for being with us here, and uh, we'd love to have you back again on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you.